open the Montpelier School Board of Directors meeting uh, Wednesday, January 5th at it's like 6.32. Um, first order of business is public comment. Um, I cannot, do you have any? Some newspaper reporter, reporters, and yeah, it looks like that's like, it. If anyone from the public wants to talk, speak up, otherwise, there's no one in the room other than Grant and Christina. And Christina. <laughs> oh, sorry, Christina. Didn't scan to the left. Um, all right, uh, no public comment. We'll move on to uh, consent agenda. Um, do I have a uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. You're making a motion or you have one? I'm making a motion. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second that. Uh, any discussion? Yep. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, now I'll move on to CVCC governance. And is that um, Jody, who I see on the, yep. the board. Hi, can Jody. You, Hi, Jody. Yeah, Jody. Can you hear us okay? And I can. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I first want to apologize because the warnings that I actually need you to approve, I only sent to Libby yesterday. Um, and then I realized, having been at the Washington Central Board an hour ago, that there was a couple of errors in there. So I did just barely send the revised edition. I don't know if everyone has had a chance to see that. No, they haven't. Okay. So let me uh, see if I can share that on my screen. I can't. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> so there are two um, two articles in the warning that need to be uh, moved forward by the board if you so desire, and then also signed by all the board members so that this our um, request can go to vote on March 1st for town meeting. And the first is whether or not the voters shall move to create a new school district, uh, the Central Vermont Career Center School District. And then the second is around the, who they should vote for. Thanks, Libby. So I, I can do the work tonight of filling in all of the district name stuff, everything that's highlighted. You'll notice I didn't highlight in article one, it says Barry Unified Union School, that's, that needed to be insert district school here. Uh, but basically, the warning should say, shall the voters of the Montpelier Roxbury School District Public Schools vote to establish the Central Vermont Career Center School District as described in the Governance Planning Committee report approved by the State Board of Education on December 15th of 2021. And we'll find out if our 18 sending school towns would like to do that. And then the second one is the follow-up to elect the board members the at-large board members, because if you'll remember, six of our board members would be appointed from the school district boards. So somebody from your own board, and then the rest would be at-large from our four largest districts. Everyone across the 18 towns can vote for those people and can sign their petitions, but um, they have to reside in one of those districts, the largest districts to get that vote. So what we need is for each school district, all six of them to approve these this warning so that we can move forward and have that vote happen on town meeting day. I move to approve the warning to establish the, or ask voters to establish the Central Vermont Career Center School District. I second it. Any discussion? I have a question. It's the article two, is it new board members or members from our board? Okay. Those article two refers to the at-large members. So those are new board members who would only be working for the Central Vermont Career Center School District. And, okay. and in addition to that, we will send someone from our board to 
to represent our school district on, on that board. Was my understanding, is that right, Jody? Yeah. Correct. And so would those names be in this same uh, ballot? Yes, those names will show up. Um, basically, anyone in any of the six, uh, the four larger school districts that wants to run needs to do the same thing that you would do for running for your for the Montpelier Roxbury. So they would fill out a candidate form, and they have to get the sixty signatures on their petition. And so those forms are available on our website and at all of our town clerks. Oh, okay, and, and that should be done before. Okay. That would have to be, they have to get that in by January 24th. Okay. <clears throat> Jody, what happens if someone doesn't run from any one of those four towns or districts? You know what? I haven't gone into that report recently <laughs> enough to see what happens okay. then. I believe um, we would seek an appointment. Okay. okay. I just need one minute to read. Do we know if this would be a separate warning or can it be consolidated into our normal warning that the board will look at next meeting? It actually has to be a separate warning. Which means separate ballots by our towns? Correct, ours is going to be pink. The, the town clerks have all met to discuss this. Uh, uh, we were together on the 28th and so they know that this is happening. You gotta sit two warnings together? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, any further discussion or questions? Is that a hand me or are you? No, no. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Excellent. Um, and it was just the one we had to approve, right? Yeah, thank you. And if if you end up um, doing that on the same day that you sign your own warning and warrant, that's fine. We just need to make sure that it gets done in in the same amount of time as all of the other school district warnings. So thank you. Jody, did you say we all need to sign it? Jim does. I need I to do. Oh, it's all the boards, right? Yes. Just not all the board members, but just all the boards. Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks Jody. Sorry, Jody. Thanks, one, more on this. Talk, okay. sorry, one more question. Sure. Is, there, is that is the is the your budget also be included in the March as a separate thing? The budget is still going to be um, the Barry Unified Union School Districts for this school year. Okay. Um, even though it may apply to the new district, it doesn't. It wouldn't fall under it in time. So it's still going to be just Barry City and Barry Town. And again, it doesn't impact the budgets of anyone any differently because the tuition formula still exists. And that's how we'll be using that. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thanks, Thanks Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. So Grant, I think we're on to you next. All right. Well, um, I guess I, I would start with a question. This is a full briefing, so it's like 40 some odd pages or slides. Um, the briefing will be posted on the board's website, but seeing that we don't have any visitors and that all of you have already gone through all these slides, my question is, would you like me to just kind of do an abbreviated version? We'll post the full briefing, but I could just try to hit the high points and go through it quicker than I would normally if there were visitors here. I think so. I think because we have the full um, briefing already recorded on ORCA, so people can, can watch it and access it. Um, 
I would just kind of go through and do an abbreviated version and stress any you know potential changes or other highlights that 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 might be good. But I, I think that's okay. Great, and then good use of everyone's time. On the nineteenth, the next board meeting will just be another quick one. If there's any changes, and then we'll be approving the budget warrant or yeah. warning. Um, and there and will be another chance. Does, does anyone feel differently about that approach? Okay. No, I mean, we'll still be able to ask questions. So, yeah. I'm, I'm happy with it. And, and, sorry, the philosophy is for when we had our last school board meeting where we went over the whole thing. So, so that people can access it if they wanted, like community members, if they couldn't be here today but wanted to really go, come back. Um, so just we can direct them to look at this school board and then just this yeah. is where my question is going. <laughs> yeah, so the, the full presentation was given at the first meeting, okay. then it was a, an abbreviated version. This is a full briefing that we will post the full briefing, okay. we'll just kind of skim through it, okay. but it will be available. The next one will just be highlighting any changes, but the public will get another chance to go through the whole thing because we'll have an informational hearing the day before the vote as well. Okay, perfect. And that was December 1st, just for anybody who might be watching right now, that was the December 1st meeting, right? Yeah. Where you went through the full, the full thing. Okay. Yes. So yes. they can find that. Yep. Thanks, Nan. Mm -hmm. Christina, if we switch roles, because I can't see people popping in. So if you just let people in. Thanks. All right. So you've got the presentation in front of you. Um, I think I'm going to skip to, let's see. How about the changes slide? That's like the seventh or seventh. There we go. So the changes since the last time, equalized pupils, I did change that number. It went down by 26 and a half students, which is a little disheartening. Um, it actually went down by 36 and a half, but we know that there's a correction that the AOE has to make that's going to be about 10 kids. So right now, my best guess is this. 1,234. Um, that drop of 26, it's for various reasons, one of which is, as you recall, that later on we'll go through what all the steps are in, a, in that calculation. It starts with a two-year average for ADM. Last year, when I look at our two-year average for ADM, it looks like last year's number was artificially high by five. And a little personality flaw of mine is if I get good news, I don't question it enough because last year I probably should have pushed back and made sure that the number looked good. So I didn't. Um, I think that was off by about five, which is about five of this 26. 12 relates to our poverty weighting. We had 12 more kids added as a result of poverty than this year. And when I look at this year and I take our total poverty count and I increase and I multiply it by 0.25, the number this year is right. So last year, once again, it looks like last year there was a calculation problem and we had 12 extra kids in there. So a lot of this isn't anything to do with this year. It has to do with last year. Um, so an equalizing ratio is another Thing. At the very end, everybody gets hit by like 96% or something to bring all our numbers down. This year's equalizing ratio is lower than last year, and that's that equates to about five as well. Um, and then the other, the other one is pre-K, which is a real decrease, is about four kids. So now that I've dug into it, it looks like this year's number makes sense. It's not good, but it makes sense. I think there's, there, was a, there was some problems with last year's number. This could be really uh, a real problem for us because every seven kids is about a penny on the tax rate. So you look at this and you think, oh, that's like four, four cents on, you know, on the tax rate. But luckily, because of the dollar yield being so high, we can absorb this without too much of an impact. Um, the other thing that changed is CLA. If you remember last time we talked a lot about this and we thought, you know, um, property values are really a lot higher and maybe we should drop our CLA estimate even more. 
Um, luckily, we did. Montpelier came in at 80.76. That's a drop of 3.7 from last year, which is fairly significant, but not over the top. Um, luckily, we had dropped that to like 78% the last time we gave a briefing. So this was actually better than the last time we guessed at it. Roxbury is a drop of 8.1%. So that's a huge drop. But remember, Roxbury was a very high CLA. So a swing in property values can drop that a lot more dramatically because Montpelier, it's been a, long, a longer period of time since we had reappraised. Um, the good news is the last time we made a guess at CLA for Roxbury, we guessed 94%. So it didn't really impact too much whenever I re-ran the calculations. We did have some small expense changes based on actual hires for custodial um, and health benefits and everything else. It was a bit of an increase that I plugged in. Um, we did go back to Central Vermont uh, Supervisory Union and kind of renegotiated our after-school agreement with them and we were able to knock that down some. Uh, so that was good news. And now on the revenue side, our triple E or early education block grant was a little bit higher than I had previously estimated. So those were all the changes. And the next slide talks about what's left for unknowns. We still don't know for sure the equalized pupil count. Um, the, my AOE contact said maybe Monday, more likely Tuesday. So we'll see, I should have the best guess that they have by the next time we get together on uh, the 19th, I believe it is. The dollar yield, we've got the best guess that we're gonna get until town meeting day, but just as a reminder, that's set by law. So that will change at some point. I think the number we're using is as good as it gets though. Um, the only other thing that's not on there is I did get a note from the AOE saying there might be a minor change to our tech six semester average, which figures because we got their number and it was exactly what we had been using. So I was all excited. And then they came back and said, oh, maybe there's a change. So it won't be a big deal. It won't even be a full student if there is a change. So next is the at a glance. So if you look real quick, the total budget is still a 4.5% increase. The total education spending is still a 4% increase. What you see as a change is our ed spending per pupil is now about six and a half. And that's only because our, our equalized pupil count is lower than I had before. It's still showing up highlighted in yellow though, because I haven't gotten a real number yet. My hope is that maybe it'll bump up a little bit, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, probably skip through the enrollment projections. We've discussed that a lot. And then the theory of growth. And staffing, I think we'll, we'll, we'll hit that uh, as part of the budget changes, I think. Oh, well, actually, could you go back to that? We'll start with that district. Um, the community liaison, we did make a change here because we decided to change that from ESSER funds to local funds. So I just wanted to point out that we made the change in the chart here as well. Um, the BCBA behavior certified, board certified behavior analyst is um, suggesting use of ESSER three. Next. Um, at UES, we did switch an academic interventionist from ESSER to local to sustain that position and Thrive is one that we're suggesting use of SO3. Next, Main Street, academic interventionist using SO3. And then finally, for the high school, another academic interventionist using SO3. So if you do the math on that, there are six positions that initially were thought of using ESSER funds, whether they're currently filled or were proposed. Of those six, two have been converted over to local funding, so they're sustained already. At some point, we need to figure out, though, how we're going to address those other four, and that'll be through future budgets. All right, can we go on? 
All right, let's keep going until we get to program expenses one or two. One more. Oh, one more. Okay, so this has been updated just a little bit in the narratives, like the general education talks about the four ESSER funded positions that we still need to work on sustaining. Um, special education uh, talks about the Thrive position that we added. Career center tuition, uh, that reflects 22 six semester average kids, which hopefully will be about right. Um, I don't think anything else changed on this. So we can go to the next one. And I don't see anything here. The school board line, just as a reminder, about half of that increase is because we built in some money to mail ballots, which is an issue we're still sorting through. Okay, I don't think we need to go into revenues. And honestly, I think capital, we've kind of gone through that enough. So we could just get to the tax rate terminology. So education spending, you know what that means, equalized pupils. So this helps kind of go through what I was trying to discuss earlier. It starts with a two year average ADM. And then it gets adjusted for factors like pre-K is only 0.46 instead of a, a full kiddo. So there's a subtraction for kids that are pre-K. Secondary is an add of, of another, an additional 0.13. And secondary is seven through 12th grade. Um, poverty is an additional 0.25 times the number of kids on free and reduced. And then Limited English proficiency is a 0.2 for every uh, ELL student. That's the part that was missing. AOE had us as zero kiddos, and we know that we have probably about 50. So whenever they rerun it and get our number, then we should get another 10 kids. We talked about the dollar yield. As a reminder, what we're using now is the tax commissioner recommendation, and there were two different ones. We're using the more conservative number. I, I just want to make sure I heard you right. You're expecting that our equalized people will go up by 10? But that number was already in here. Their number was like 12, oh, 24, and I've added another 10 already. Okay. So I'm pretty confident that 12, 34 should be a good number. Um, but we'll know for sure next. Time. Okay, thank you. Um, and we already talked about CLA. That's a known now. So we can go into the next one. So here's an updated tax rate calculation. Um, once again, the yellow slides are still kind of unknown. Um, equalized pupils is definitely an unknown. Dollar yield is an unknown to the extent that it will be passed by law after the budget gets passed. Um, CLA is now plugged in. What I did do in the, the little text boxes was I gave you an indication of what the tax rate implication of some of these things are. So that drop in equalized pupils has about a three and a half cent negative tax rate impact. The dollar yield has between 21 and 25 cent positive impact. So that helps the tax rate. And that's 21 would be the impact in Montpelier, 25 in Roxbury. Or I'm sorry, that's switched. 21 in Roxbury, 25 in Montpelier. Um, the merger incentive, Absorbing that loss of two cents is about a two and a half cent impact, negative. And then the final note there for CLA, the drop in CLA for Montpelier has a negative impact of 7.6. And because it's a larger drop in Roxbury, that's an 11.9 cent um, negative impact. So next is the, the impact for every $100,000 in Montpelier, you can see, is actually a drop in taxes of $27. In Roxbury, it's an increase of $33. So um, if you look at that as far as what the change is, in Montpelier, it's a drop of 2.7 cents. In Roxbury, it's an increase of 3.3. So 
Montpelier is a decrease of one and a half percent, and in Roxbury it's an increase of two point three percent. So, fairly reasonable numbers, I think, as far as tax rate impacts. And as a reminder, um, it could in, it could change depending on the final dollar yield. It shouldn't get worse, I wouldn't think. Um, and another note: about two thirds of households get an income sensitivity credit. So as a percentage, it would still be the same kind of an increase or decrease, but the impact itself in terms of the dollars might be different. But I have a question about that. So the conversation I heard is that we're taking their income sense to, that, that credit is not money that people are getting. It's just a credit they get to their taxes. Is that how that works? Yeah, do you want to take this? Joe, you want this? <laughs> We're going to go around. It's the dollars sent to them to apply on the property tax bill. So when you get your bill, you see your total bill, but it would be less whatever your property tax credit would be. Okay. So yeah, it's it's just reduces the amount you have to pay. So you wouldn't have to pay it all and then get reimbursed or anything like that. Okay. But, you're, but you see what it is on your tax bill. And then I just updated the next slide, and there's only a few slides left. The tax rate history, just for some perspective. Um, you know, we all know that we can't control CLA. So typically, we look at the tax rates without CLA to see how we're doing. And without CLA, you can see Montpelier is actually about 11.8 cents lower for FY23 than the year before the merger, which is very good. Um, Roxbury, even with CLA factored in, is 21 and a half cents lower than before the merger. So from year to year, you, you, you might have good news or bad news, but if you look at it across the period of time from before the merger to 23, we're very good, in very good shape. And then just some outlook information. Um, you know, even though we build a budget one year at a time, we always try to look at what the future looks like so that we can try to do smart things each year to stabilize tax rates. Um, reappraisals, we know, are going to hit us next year, so CLA should be a difference next year. In Montpelier, I would think that would mean the tax rates will go down, property values will go up, though. Um, equalized pupil count, we know that the weighting is going to change. It will probably cause a significant decrease for Montpelier Roxbury, but my guess is that they will phase that in so it won't be a dramatic change in one year, I would hope. Um, enrollment is fairly stable. We know the high school is still climbing. We know that the Union Elementary School enrollment is, is declining. Um, overall, we're, we're gonna have to continue to look like this year at FTE adjustments to either shift resources or maybe it will be an opportunity for us to convert some of those ESSER funded positions into local so that we can sustain them over the long term. Um, the merger incentive, this is the last year for FY23 that we have to absorb that two cent decrease. So that's good news going forward. And then the summary. Um, you know, with, with ESSER funding and with that increase in the dollar yield, it allowed us to add a lot of much needed resources this year, which was excellent, very good for the kids and very good for the taxpayers because we were able to do that without a big increase in tax rates. Um, I already went through these percentages. The total budget is up four and a half. Ed spending because of increase in revenues is only a 4% increase. Because we lost some equalized pupils, that's a big increase, but the bottom line tax rates are very reasonable, even a decrease in Montpelier um, and a reasonable increase for Roxbury. And that's it in this very abbreviated version of the briefing. Um, plenty of time for you to ask any questions. Questions for Graf? Thank you again. Question. Yep, go for it. The, the, the sort of the circumstances around that um, renegotiation of the, the after school program, just sort of how that 
comes about and what's involved and and you want me to start kids, do you, you want to talk about you it? Just tell me to shut up when i got to <laughs> i also just to add to that so it's in one question i was just curious if that renegotiation was going to result on a change in programming no. or how it would impact or if it would be backfilled via s or three and just how that might affect the students no, no it's not so affect programming really what it boils down to is when we first merged um we went into the bridges program for after school at roxbury when we first merged they were doing a um what's 20, the 21 c grant. 21 21st century grant was it was able to pay for a lot of that and buried in page like 81 said how much we were going to have to pay as a school district and it was like ten thousand dollars and then it just said future years will be negotiated or determined well that 10 jumped up to I believe the initial number was like 25 the next year. Yeah. And we said, oh, we can't do that. We, we said we can do 15, but no more than that. Then 15 went to 17 and a half, then went to 20. And based on Libby's leadership, we basically just went back and said, can you walk us through this and help us explain, or help us to be able to explain why we went from 10,000 to 22 and a half thousand dollars in FY23 can you give us some backup? Tell us how much other districts are spending or other schools are spending. Um, and basically as a back and forth to that, it was revealed that there wasn't any great analysis behind what we were being asked to, to provide. And so we basically reset it back to the original 10,000. And we were informed basically that the only real expense was the coordinator that was coming out of district funds for central Vermont. And so a fair share of that really would be around the $10,200 for us. And they agreed that that would be fair. So we were able to drop it all the way back down to 10,200. It doesn't represent any kind of change to programming or services to kids. And in exactly. fact, they're writing us into the next 21C grant. They're writing Roxbury into it, which will sure up bridges for what is it? You would know four years, five, five, five years. years. Yeah, five yeah. Years yeah. So that grant is going to be restarted. I know that there was yes. concern among a number of family members that could afford bridges with the grants that if the cost per student were to go up, it would be a hardship for a lot of families. And I don't know. If there is no change to that unless unless it's changed by Central Vermont. There is a reapplication process that needs to take place. It's not a guaranteed grant. It's a competitive grant process um, where the district needs to go back in and reapply for the money. So it's not rubber stamped, but as far as I know, 21C is not on the federal shopping block. Um, no. So it's likely, but not guaranteed. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, yeah, you mentioned or you had in your slides um, the equalized pupil count that that's uh, going down 26, right? Um, coupled with the fact that um, the budget's going up, um, the, the ed spending is going up. Um, our ed spending per pupil is it's gone up 6.2, right? That's what we have over here, 18,252. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious. Is there a, I could be completely off, off base here, but is there, a, a, is there an impact spending too much per pupil uh, as compared to the other schools other districts in the state? And is there a penalty that we yes. get because of that? And how close are we? Are, where, where do we rank in terms of that? It's, a, it's an excellent question. And I'm pleased that I have a, an excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> So the excess, there is an excess penalty threshold that um, I saw it on the, on one of the slides. That in, in FY18, the year before we merged, Roxbury exceeded that threshold, which is why their tax rate was so high. Um, but we're at, what was it, 18, 18252. Right now, um, the AOE has said that for FY23, the excess spending threshold is 19,000, I don't know, 977? 
I think it's, it's one just of, it's, under twenty thousand. Yeah, so one we, of the slides you have it in the notes. Yeah, yeah, we're in we're in great shape, so we're good. What? So we're we're obviously coming close to that, right? Um, well, it's two thousand. It's almost two thousand. Uh, thousand off. Yeah, like seventeen hundred, like that. So, okay, so that's, per student, which yeah, is yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm not at all worried about okay. exceeding the excess spending threshold for that. Yeah, if you what what Christina was just saying is is true. It's that's this number is probably a pretty average number. Okay. Statewide. I have a a question. Was there an increase on the ELL programming because yes. of our family in those reflected here? Yes, as a matter of fact, no, think, we increased it prior to our new family. Um, but then that just justifies it. We're going to increase it this year. This year, because we might have yeah. two families. Yeah. yeah oh, so, I didn't know about a second family. Yeah, it's new. Oh. Yeah, we we planned on um, doing that because it's a need now. That's good. Yeah. So the was it a point four or point six? We are at point six, and we need to increase it to point four in order to get to a one point zero. Do you know when the new fans oh, We can talk about that later. <laughs> Other questions? All right. Fantastic. That's it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So next, right. thank you. Thank next you time we will that. have a, an actual budget for you to approve with the warning for you to approve and sign. And then we'll sort through the other warning for CDCC as well. Actually, can I have one, one more granular question? Is it, this is very granular. It's like, is there coffee here for teachers at UES? Coffee? Yeah. Yeah. Is it? There's curd machines. Okay. I think they even have a fancy brew thing that they. No, nah, that's here like at a, MHS. The teachers got that thing. here at MHS at UES. I actually I gave I gave them personally a curry last year. Yeah, they need uh, pot. So. They can order. They have that in their budget. They can, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, they, so they can order that. The UAS Caregivers Alliance yeah. was yeah. gonna buy. So, yeah. I want more of those questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So next. We have um, comments on the budget, which I don't think anyone's jumped in on. Okay, uh, so we will. Was that not with um, was that not with Marvin share today? Uh, Those were ESSER comments. Okay. The. Yeah. I think I think we actually had scheduled time for public comment because there were members of the public who came for the presentation. Um, there are not. Uh, so we are way ahead of the schedule, which is not the worst thing in the world. Um, second reading on of the policy G seven special education. Um, any. Comments or changes or edits to, to that? I would just add that we're still waiting for the manual from the AOE. So okay. um, we are hoping to write a little context at the beginning, but until we see that manual, we can't really move to the work of doing it because we don't know what it says. <laughs> I'm not sure you'll see that soon. Delay this until it's out. Well, we are supposed to have it adopted by today. Uh, apparently, they did get an extension to submit the manual, but um, we haven't seen the actual thing that says that they that we also get an extension. So maybe maybe we should just adopt it and then go back once we have the manual, just to be on the compliance side. Is what I would recommend. I don't know what Jim. Like if we were to put a link to, or if we were to add the wording from the manual as just to bring it to the board as a reading, does it have to go through three readings again? Is it that a major a change? 
I think yeah, it's probably yes if we're actually make changes to the policy. Okay. Um, but we can do that. I mean, this is not a topic we just put it on the right, right. For three readings. Yeah. Yeah, and then we'll we'll be largely in compliance over the couple week gap. And, So what you'd be recommending is put the third reading on for next agenda, and then we're, we won't have it before February. So then we prove it first in February and then bring it back if we need to exactly. for when we get it. Do, do we have any sense of when that'll be, that manual will be done? Well, we are at adjournment. I just, one thing I do want, oh, a couple things. Um, the next meeting, in addition to approving the budget, uh, we're also having the uh, several members of uh, our legislative representatives come in. Um, so we're gonna set up a round table. Uh, you know, so give thought to questions you wanna ask them. I think um, <coughs> Libby's strong, strong desire is that we send a message that in this time of, uh, Keeping our heads above water, that, that new mandates is are not something we're looking for, but rather really support from the legislature that <coughs> get us through, uh, you know, the time of shortages and and difficulties. Um, yeah, obviously, you can ask your own questions and bring your own mandates, but that that's the sentiment, and certainly the sentiment I share at this at this time. Um, and then, yeah, other questions, Jim. Yeah, there's there's clearly some. Uh, you know, major discussions going around about uh, equalized pupils and waiting that to be more equitable. Uh, so we have questions around those. Um, pensions. Pensions. Who's, who's coming? Sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Uh, several members of our legislative. I've, are coming to our board meeting? They're coming to our board meeting. Um, I have to go back and see. It's, it, it's got to be most of them. Um, I think they all said yes. I think they all said yes. I don't know if I've heard from Jay Hooper yet. Um, and one note on that, we're supposed to be in Roxbury at the next board meeting. We switched that around to just for space because um, there's a space challenge at Roxbury if we want to do what we want to do with, oh, okay. <laughs> with circles and stuff. So the next board meeting with the legislators will be here in the library and okay. the, the, the meeting okay. after that will be at Roxbury. Okay. So, yeah, so give thought to, again, you know, questions or or comments uh, you want to deliver. Um, Are we asking them to provide us with any information? <laughs> uh, definitely send things you want me to ask them ahead of time. I'm just going to give them a general request to talk about issues that they think are pertinent to boards. Um, yeah, I know Mary Hooper especially is involved in the, um, in the education committee. Um, yeah, you know, I think Andrew Perslick has been pretty deeply involved in this as well. So we've got a couple couple members who are really up on. So I'm Senator Perslick's on the Senate Ed committee. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to encourage them to give us an overview of what they see being on the plates that we should should be concerned about. But as far as the information exchange, but yes. And so the board knows I testified yesterday to the Senate Ed um, with the, all the V's, VPA, VSBA, VSA, and the Teachers Association. We were pretty frank about the situation at schools right now. Was that recorded? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. I'm at the end. Okay. <laughs> if you want to see me. Yeah, unless you hear the dialogue overall. It's actually pretty good to uh, look at that video because uh, Secretary French gave an overview of all the stuff, which is like the kind of the end of the year. Yeah, uh, the challenges are pretty steep. Apparently, in France, they just found a virus today that's a lot more spready than Omicron. So well, that's excellent news, Jim. Grab onto your chairs. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Based on my day today, that's just yeah. excellent. <laughs> I'm going to check some notes on that real quick. <laughs> so, 
So I do, I do believe I didn't get to hear all of it, but that in the state of the state, the governor was proposing possibly using some of the ed fund balance to send to school districts for career development stuff. I don't know if that would be something we'd want to kind of. I mean, I'll certainly follow it. And you guys know if I hear anything, if you don't hear it, but by that time, maybe when the lawmakers are here, they might be interested in our thoughts on that. And it's almost like it requires more administrative attention at all than can it wait. <laughs> I, I, I think that's a good message to deliver. And yeah, sometimes, you know, small good things can be the thing to draw the brakes camels back in a year like this. So, unless uh, we could just give it to the our new career center district. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to think this through just because um, I, I want to find a kind of balance of a line between our emergency and the pandemic reality, but also how that relates to what kids are facing today as well. The increase in bullying harassment, the increase of mental health problems. So, you know, saying no new mandates, whatever, we have this money and we, we have black personnel, lack of like all of these things. and. And so I, I grapple with that. I grapple with our teachers are really tired and I support them. And I want, you know, all the districts, I know that you're working a lot and that everybody, you know, is doing a lot, but I also grapple with that and the fact that our kids are behind, our kids, you know, our bullying is increasing and kids are suffering. So, and families are suffering. So like, how do we move that balance of that urgency but the reality that problems that we have before, before the pandemic continue to be problems and even higher, you know, they come out. And just like from me being on the ground with people, like I, I just grapple with that sense. Like you have a very different sense of urgency than I have with the people that I work with. So it's, it's kind of like this anxiety that we both have around like, yes, and yes, and so, how do we support the kids even if like what we're thinking about is like how do we what is it that we need to do to be able to grapple with our reality and take it into account other communities stuff that can happen to alleviate that right like how do we bridge those things and how do we think of transformation and how do we think of healing together versus so that's, I just want us to grapple with that conversation in our heads. Not necessarily to bring it up about now, but kids are suffering and really bad. So, and then our teachers are and superintendents and everybody's tired, but you know, that is a reality that. I think that's a good point in the workforce challenge piece because I'm thinking, what would it take, right? Because we do have money, but there's not like the bodies to do the work that the children need or that the school, like, so how can we use this opportunity? Like, I know that they're talking about investing in like nursing because there's a nursing shortage, but there's also clearly a shortage of education professionals. And is it like a loan forgiveness? Is it a training program? Is it in like that alternate fast relationship? Or, like, are there things that we can do because we actually do seem to have the financial resources yeah. at this time that we really need it, but we can't find the people to serve that role. So that's a, it's a good point. I don't know what we could ask them to do, but I want to make sure that the workforce is not just narrowed down and oversimplified, that it very much is also education workforce, I think. And they're the same people who can't afford to buy a house in Vermont and can't afford, you know, can't, can't, work with that child care and they're the same folks and so it's all tangled into that yeah i mean i think that's a great point i think I, the way i grapple in my mind is i really think now is the time to start thinking about things we can do outside of schools and placing new burdens on schools to alleviate pressures those are great ideas make it you know make it easier for uh you know for teachers to to get masters to get qualified to have their debt forgiven um beef up services that that support schools because we ask a lot of our schools so beef up those services outside of schools that in a lot of countries are much more developed than they are here um yeah you know increase our mental health services outside of schools uh increase accessibility decrease costs I, I think those are great things to ask for and kind of 
you know, paint the problem that when you, you know, put so much pressure on schools, um, those fault lines start to show in a pandemic because, you know. I mean, Libby's basically our primary care physician, right? Yeah. <laughs> For <I am. laughs> But there is, so there is the community schools bills, which I know that we're not, well, we don't have the title to apply for it, but you know, that community schools like thinking of like that model of all those services, all those connections, um, who like community schools have proven in some states to work and, and, and some of those things. So like just thinking for our district to think about, about that, it's like, what are the relationships we need to increase with the local community here that can support these students after school programs, what it, you know, whatever it is that we are gonna need to make this pandemic livable for some of these families. Absolutely. Does Washington County Mental Health have a relationship with the school system that's active? We have a complicated and small relationship with Washington County Mental Health, which is a, probably a different board meeting. Um, however, they're just briefly, their business model that they have is a pod model that places like Central Vermont buy a pod. Um, they can't staff it. But in that pod comes behavior interventionists and, and people with it, right? But they can't staff their full pod. And, if, and it's very expensive. Um, and if you don't have that level of need for a pod, then basically they say, we don't service you. So we can call them when we have a significant need for a child um, for Choice Academy or something like that. And if there is a spot, then they will talk to us. There are no spots um, for those services right now. So um, we, because we don't buy a pod and because they have no spots in, their, in the school that they run, we have very limited conversations with Washington County Mental Health um, unless a student already has that. And we have a, we have a very small amount of kids who have that relationship with them. So now I have understood though that we've been able to, through community networks, we've been able to get some kids some services pretty quickly that are connected to Washington County Mental Health, um, which is really good, right? Uh, but we don't have a thriving partnership. I, I couldn't call them on the phone and say, hey, we need help. What can you do for us? They, they probably wouldn't talk to me. Because historically, the community agencies are, they essentially pay horrible. And yeah. so nobody stays. And so the community. Yeah, they don't work, have the staff. Yeah. Right. The community work that, that is so essential to keeping people out of the hospital, providing services, yep. to, to, that, that when people are at this stage of their mental health challenges, yep. as opposed to complete crisis, yep. it just doesn't really happen. They're primarily funded by the state. Right. And that's, I mean, I don't know. If that's the that's the conversation I would like the legislators to have. How do we fund that that piece so that, that our community mental health association can be thriving so we can have a thriving partnership with them? Um, because the current business model doesn't work for schools of our size or districts of our size. I would also argue that there's mental health and there's mental health, right? Like you can have a punitive mental health system that is not going to support the students the way that we want them. And there is healing systems that take into a lot a more thing than just like a therapy session or like a emergency psychiatric visit. Um, so, so this is why when I think about transformation about it's about thinking of these systems. And I know Julia, you guys know Julia Schiffitz. She wrote a letter back uh, last year about signed by 17 local therapists that said, you know, here's the things that we're seeing. And she created a program with Ryan Herity at UES that got taxed, like really, you know, like in this first year at UES, it was like, oh my God, we have no more space. And so for, 
you guys that are new and there were, it was like a local system where therapists were able to say, hey, we have a kid in need who can take this kid. And then, you know, it, it was like a referral system done by them. So something like that, that we can think about, like how do we increase it? Just get in, we can't go back to the same thing we keep doing and then failing again, even if we have a million dollars. So systems sometimes don't fail. So I, I just, I love, the community here in Montpelier. And I know there's so much love and giving and desire to make all these things work that even for our legislature, you know, like I cannot say the same thing for like some other towns, but um, yeah, just grappling with that. I just don't want us to close the door on us and saying we don't have it. We, it's not for Libby to think on her own because she's already taxed. So for us to also help to think about what what it, what could it take? We are the ones talking to the community and knowing the community that lives here. So I'll step back by. Yeah, no, I think those are all good points. Like we definitely need to think, think proactively about how to make things better and um, but also be mindful of the effect that those have and make sure that they're helping and not, not creating creating work that right now is really hard to do. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention, thank you, Rhett, for uh, volunteering to be on the committee that Nathan is putting together. Uh, we still need one more brave soul to um, to volunteer for that. So I'm just putting that call out again. Uh, if you don't want to jump now, but, but definitely uh, think about it. I think given that, that Red's on from Roxbury, that uh, probably means that one of the Montpelier rights would be ideal. Um, I'm sorry, what committee is it? It's the committee for Nathan's visioning process. Oh. For something in school, so I'm going to try. <laughs> No, I, I know everyone is is uh hired another person today. <laughs> I know, like, <laughs> we're getting them up. Uh, yeah, but definitely definitely think about it. So um and I think if someone did it, we might be open to excusing that person from another committee, perhaps. Uh especially if it's, it's a committee where there's some redundancy, so. All right, uh, motion to adjourn. Yep. Just quickly, I send out uh, the little flyer for the community sessions for next week. If you have any feedback on F179, so thanks, Libby, if we could send, I'll send it to Anna, if that's okay with you. So send, and I'm wondering if, if there is a way to send it in your list, just for everybody. We, you know what, Anna, we can talk afterwards, but we can talk afterwards about some ideas I have. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. The, um, the statute or guideline or rules that say that Roxbury has to perform certain things like mailing ballots or allowing on citizens to vote whatever the whatever the topic is that it has to be the same as Montpelier is that in Act 46 or is that in our specific charter I think neither of the above I think it's um I think the ones around voting are are separate from any laws of the state that's state level yeah. so maybe that <clears throat> could also be a potentially a topic for discussion at our next meeting because I really I really have concerns that Montpelier constituency has an intention, passes it, and then is held up if because Roxbury doesn't feel the same way. And there may be, you know, we can make many efforts to try to get people together and, and have compromise or whatever you want to call it, but the likelihood that they'll always see things the same is not high um, for every issue. And I and I, I think it's unfortunate if you know. The will of one group is is you know stopped by the will of, of a super minority. You know what I mean? That feels wrong. Um, so I don't know what can be done. That would be a great.
topic. I think that's a, yeah, legislators. <clears throat> agree. It's a fantastic topic. I mean, I'm sure it's a problem all across. If that's the, it if that's the rule everywhere, then it must be yeah. holding up a lot of progress. Yeah, yeah. and I, and I think it's the especially the idea of you know consolidating districts means that you put you know some small towns into the big towns, mm -hmm. and um, you know small towns have a, a real uh, you know allegiance to and history of town meeting, and it's just not really practical in a place like Montpelier. So um, that seems like you can structure the law so that doesn't become an impediment or or friction point. Can I just really quickly, because I feel like a point of clarification um, with regards to the legislature and what I feel like I'm, I've heard from Libby and other superintendents and principals, et cetera. My understanding is that the request isn't, you know, don't do anything at all. It's don't put on our plate one more unfunded mandate. When exactly. Like super, super thin. It's not, don't, you know, invest in, um, various systems of support for our communities and kids. It's schools have been stretched very thin for a very long time, but been cracking for a very long time because we've put, we've turned our school systems into reservoirs for so much of our public policy shortcomings and social shortcomings that, um, yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely it. I mean, really, yeah, focus on, um, <laughs> Not just dealing with the crisis, but I think dealing with the healing and, and the restoration that needs to occur. But do do it in a way that that understands restraints and doesn't say, you know, here's six new things that the superintendent needs to implement in April. Um, are are there things that are being asked for to um, make it more attractive for recruiting educators and education professionals? Yeah, we all talked about that. If you watch the testimony. Then, or and you read uh, Jeannie and my so I testified with Jeannie Collins, who's a superintendent down in Rutland, and uh, that's from today, the testimony yesterday. Yeah. Um, and Jeff Bannon talked about it at length. Um, I believe Jay Nichols did too, I can't remember exactly from the BPA, uh, but we all talked about different ways. So, for instance, one. Jeannie brought up there's a you know clause in teachers retirement they can only work so much time in order to get their pension and right now there's some retired teachers who really want to fill gaps in the workforce but they can't because they can't work so long so she was like wave that for a year <laughs> that is something you can do really easily just yeah. wave it for a year or two um, so that's just an example of of how we can get through this stoppage quickly through work of the legislature that would really help us I mean, there's other ideas too. That testimony. Senate head, not Senate head. Yeah. Can I move to a different wrap up topic? Or, yes. Okay. Um, I just felt really compelled to acknowledge um, the news that we got this week about our 80% vaccination rate. I think any victories we can acknowledge yes. and appreciate is worth noting. I continue to be really impressed by the quality of education that my kiddo is getting, the quality of communication we get from her principal and from Libby. Um, and then even just tonight, we got a note about like checking interest on booster clinics. I mean, the, the list goes on. And it, I just think we, I, I would like to just publicly acknowledge, and I know a lot of families feel really grateful we're in this school district during this and and I just can't say enough about our gratitude for you and your team and all the parents who are volunteering to do testing. And the communication is such a um, reassuring at a time that's still really hard to be a parent during all this stuff. And I just really wanted to express my gratitude to you for all your communities. And we got enough interest. We'll have that booster clinic probably the week of the 17th. And that's a big deal. A lot of districts are not doing anything like that. Sorry. I mean, I was after my day today. I was on the horn of the BDH page saying I need a booster clinic now. Yeah, a lot of districts are not doing essential booster clinics. They're like, kids, you need to go out and do this. I just know we've yeah, we've spent so much time hearing about the huge strain on our teachers in the classroom, 
but for what it's worth, their efforts are are paying off because I do from, from my small place and what I hear from other families is they're still getting a really good quality experience and getting challenged um, on top of being safe. So our teacher anxiety level is is high. is skyrocketing right now. Yeah, absolutely. So be nice to a teacher. Give them a hug. Send them a chocolate bar. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Anything else? Well, great. Come, come prepare to some good, good thoughts and questions for um, next week. Come prepare to approve a budget uh, and um, keep the K95 masks on and stay safe and get boosted if you don't already. <laughs> Ah, and get your 12 to 15, even if we don't, I know we're going to have a clinic, but yep. I think even before it. then, you can take your kiddo up to uh, one of several locations and get them boosted too, because that's going to be important. Yep. All right, uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Great, have a good night.